Welcome, everybody. I'm so excited to see all of you um, coming in. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the agenda for today is actually, I would like to talk about a bit of, um, like to start off with an introduction of, uh, of where this project came about and um, introduce to you the CRI model. We will do a couple of suggested hands-on activity in class. We will revisit the art of questioning using graspable math. Uh, Louise Roy, we're lucky to have uh, Louise Roy from Reci MST to guide us through this activity. Um, you'll be you'll have access to lots of resources that you could use in your teaching and in your classes. And of course, I'll be inviting you for invitation for action at the end. All right. So I am uh, lucky. Uh, my name is Micheline Amar. I'm your new uh, math and science uh, um, uh, curriculum. Uh, uh, consultant. And um, I have this wonderful team of people, wonderful team of people behind me today to support me for this presentation. Monsieur Martin Franca, which is a pet consultant. Louise, uh, Louise Roy, which is Reci MST. Julie Boursier also is uh, Reci for First Nation and Inuit. Uh, Monsieur Richard Pinchot, uh, which is a technical coordinator and uh, and the backbone of this. <laughs> and of course, uh, Madame Nicole uh, Martin, which is also a pet consultant for, uh, for um, First Nation and Inuits. And I'm very, very thankful for all of you for, for helping me put this together for today. So that being said, I hope by the end of this workshop, you will be able to recognize the benefit of CRA model, access a collection of in-class activity, virtual activities, and manipulative, and rediscover the art of questioning through the use of graspable math. Now, I know um, our teaching realities comes down to students' evaluation criterion had changed from knowledge-based to competency-based. I just left the classrooms in mid, last mid-October, and this is something I had to face with my teaching um, for years and years, all right? So our students have to go through, um, they're evaluated on complex situations that look more and more like this. I know in, in, our, in our field, there is a lot of terminology gets thrown around. And sometimes it's really um, an issue understanding what they mean. So what's the difference between learning situation, situation uh, problem, what is a complex problem? All of these, they come, into, um, they come into play when we're starting to design these situations and we're like, but I thought I covered it here, but it's not. So really, if we, if we, if we take a minute to think about what they mean is when we're talking about a learning situation, we're talking about a situation that you're giving to your student, but with guided questions, meaning that your main purpose in this type of learning situation is actually targeting the, uh, the, uh, the, the problem skills. So you're testing if they have the mechanic to solve these kind of situations. So when we're talking about guided, there's less of them thinking on how to do it, more of you like tell them, okay, well, we need to know this first. So let's see, can you do that, right? We need, they need this second, can you do that? So you're checking their, uh, their skills. Um, for example, like if you're, if you have a situation on planning a meal budget, right? So, um, you have, uh, you have to make spaghetti and meat sauce and, um, we were having a party for 10 people, right? So what would be the total cost of the spaghetti? What would be the total cost of the meat sauce if it's sold in pound, like in sold in, in pounds and you want it in kilogram? where there's conversion, you're checking if they're able to do conversion. Um, you're looking for the taxes that gets added to it. So in a way you're guiding them on how to actually get what you want them to get by checking what kind of skills they're, do, they're able to do. Versus when we're looking at a situational problem, this is what we find in our evaluations is they're not guided. Students only receive a description of a problem with like lots of information and they'll have to put the thinking together. So for example, similar to the spaghetti party is you will, the problem will provide the students with list of, let's say, um, list of vegetables and fruits and meats. And um, they'll give them uh, how, uh, they'll give them access to maybe some menus and uh, a budget. And they'll say, well, we're having 10 people over 
I would like you to create a meal with this budget. Do you have enough money? So the, the students will have to create a meal, find the, but like he has to decide on the meal. He has to decide on the ingredient. He has to decide, he has to go about it. He has to plan the process from A to Z without any guidance in term of, um, in term of uh, planification and resolution. And, and that's where it's interesting because for that kind of problem, there's many way. So let's take, for example, if Kate goes about it by saying, okay, I have this amount of money, I'm able to take out the taxes and this is my actual amount of money I have to work with and work her way backwards saying, well, okay, if I have 10 people, maybe I'll plan it for one and then I'll multiply it by 10 and work my way through. Somebody else might just say, no, let me create my menu and see how much it costs and work its way and see if it if they could get to that number. So there's many, many ways. There's not one way better than the other. It's it's the student is displaying his way of going about resolving a problem. That's the strategy that the student's taking to actually resolving a problem. So obviously these competencies, they come in uh, into the three competencies that we're aware of, and I put them in a way that I understood them. So in competency one, when we're talking about interpretation, decoding, and representation, we're talking about specifically when the students look at a problem and make it his or hers, like we're able to take out what the, 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 the variables that he may use, the other variable that he may not use, the information that he may not use, and, and represent it in, in different ways. Uh, some students may like to draw it, some people may doodle, some people may like think out loud in their head. So it's it's the, the taking it, taking the information and making it their own. Now, the second competency, now we're looking at the planification strategies that to carry the uh, to carry on with the resolution of the problem. So what way would I go about it? This is where it's interesting because the students has to demo how he understands uh, how he understands um, how to solve a problem. So it's the strategy, it's the thinking process that's behind the actually the plugging in and the the results. Uh, of course, that's part of it, but it's a minute part of it. All right, then the communication, of course, it goes into both. You have to communicate what you think. You have to transfer from what's in your head to your piece of paper to the person. So ideally, when we're looking at a resolution of problem, this is how the student is actually evaluated on. And I found this table really, really interesting because if this is, inc is incorporated in every uh, situational problem or every learning situation from the beginning, the students, you, you could train the student to self question uh, to, to question themselves if they're on the right track or not. Um, like, for example, if we take a look at the two first points, interpretation, representation, and modeling, these are my C1. Planification resolution will fall into, and reflection will fall into like my C2 and communication and all of them. So the step that you may look at for the two first ones is when you're identifying, gathering, and organizing information, but also making it your own by modeling it. And modeling it could be using manipulative, could be drawing diagrams, could writing equation, creating graph. These are the way you're modeling your problem. So you're making it your own. And these are kind of guidance questions that you could train the students to kind of reflect on once the problem is done and go back and check. How well can I gather and organize information uh, when, I'm, uh, when I'm solving a problem? How well can I model the problem? Do I need math manipulative to represent the problem? All right, so these are kind of little cues that you could prompt the student to think, okay, it's not working, why? Is it because I don't have the right tool? Is it because I don't understand? Is it because my, I don't have learning strategies? This is where you actually get the students to be part of his learning versus, uh, I don't know, I don't know, and, and asking the teacher to fix all these problems, right? Now, the second part is when we're looking at the planification and resolution, we're talking now at strategy. Okay, I have to choose a strategy to solve. And now, uh, once I choose that strategy, I'm gonna apply it into my problem and get an answer, right? Uh, and then I'm gonna go back and check if that, if did I answer the question and if, if my answer makes sense. So strategy of questioning, you could actually teach the students to ask, did I use different ways to illustrate the problem? Did I pick a math strategy uh, A and a math strategy B to solve the problem? So finding different ways to, resolve, to solving a problem or actually 
you could have different students do that and they share their ways of solving a problem. And, and they could see that some techniques might be different, for, you know, some strategies are different than other, but they both get to the same answer. Um, the other thing is you could get them to do for, especially for resolution is how well uh, can I choose and apply one or more problem uh, solving strategies? Did I answer the question? Does the answer make sense? All right. And of course the reflection I find is the most, most important part is when you give a learning situation or, or a complex problem to the student and you get them go through the painful process of doing it and get them to go back and not generalize, but more appropriate their learning in terms of, okay, what did I try? What didn't work? Um, what did I do right? What didn't I do right? Uh, how, uh, how are they different? How are they the same? To get them to think, to ask these questions, but making it part of the learning, it's very rich. And I know it's it's sometimes at, at some point it's really, really long and difficult, but it gets easier and better with time when they're equipped with these kind of questions. Um, I just want to go back over the strategy because that is something actually is that it didn't make sense to me because knowing that I'm a math teacher, that strategy, I know some, I use some, I teach some, but I didn't realize there's so many more. And this is where I came about to take the time and actually show you uh, or like present you the other choices too. Well, what is a math strategy is an approach to finding a solution to a problem. It is similar to choosing the right tool for the job. So for example, if you're a plumber, you're trying to unscrew a bolt, which tool will you use? You know, there's many, many tools to resolve the problem to unscrew that bolt. So which tool would you use? Some people may use a wrench, some people may use other things, right? So the tool you choose depends on the problem you're trying to solve. Sometimes we need multiple tools to get the job done. It's the same way we're talking about math strategies. It's like, what tool do I need to get this done? All right. Now, when we're talking about example of strategies, and this is the part that I found really, really interesting, but today we'll only look at the first one, but all of these strategies are strategies that we could actually bring into our class or, you know, and, and teach the students, right? And I'll show you how these strategies actually doesn't only work in math, it works in all the other courses. Right. So, for example, when you're talking about visualizing and we're going to get to that in depth more in, in, in a few minutes, uh, when we're talking about visualizing is using manipulative material to connect to the problem, draw a picture. Many pictures may lead to correct solution. Label your step to resolve. So this is a, a more kinesthetic approach, a more visual approach. Uh, of course, the other ones like experiment, trial and error, uh, use tables, make lists, um, logical reasoning, seeing, examining if there's a general re relationship. Our brain is wonderful, it's lazy and looks for pattern and wants to connect things to things as already it already knows, so it doesn't do the effort of actually remembering new stuff. Uh, of course, finding pattern. If you see that there's a continuous behavior, a continuous pattern, right, uh, with, within our, our math um, problem, then you could recognize that there's, there's a connection, right? And also the famous working backward. If I give you a problem with a solution and I tell you how did I get there, right? This whole backward thinking, right? So, uh, in our in our in our workshop today, we're really going to focus mainly on the math manipulative and math uh, representation strategies, because personally, I find that's what fortify and deepen math understanding. And actually, based on that, I did lots and lots of research, and there's plenty plenty of of, of research to do that. So. Uh, we could go to to WooClap to to do the survey. Um, not to the survey, or if you want, you could just write it in the chat box. Okay. Do you use manipulative and one kind? And if you don't, that's fine. Or if you don't know what it is, that's okay too. Okay. I'll give you a minute and then we'll move forward. Can you please let me know because yes. I don't have access to the chat. <laughs> okay. So um, marie says she uses manipulatives in class or in, in, in person and online. She uses Desmos. Desmos. Yeah, uh, I see graspable math, Desmos. Uh, last year I used Google Slide as manipulatives online. Uh, someone says I use them, yes. Um, graph, dry, uh, graph dry erase board, pattern blocks, 
tiles, dice, measuring, cu measuring tapes, cups. Mm -hmm. uh, some people also talk about Desmos, but I haven't used it myself. Uh, algebra tiles, pi, pi fraction puzzle, tangrams, Barbies, rubber bands, mm -hmm. Barbie bungee. Mm -hmm. Maybe someone wants to <laughs> elaborate. The Barbies are, were awesome. Yes, they were. So can someone explain? Because I'm not uh, from the math field and Barbies. <laughs> yeah. There's a whole activities of that. Yes, go ahead. Um, um, I think it's the, oh, there's pictures that uh, AV mm -hmm. says to Maria Vies pictures. There's also videos. Well, do, do you want me to explain Barbie Bungie or later or no? Or? Oh, no, well, go ahead. I'm mm -hmm. sure everybody's curious. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've used Barbies a lot. When I, uh, so just a little short story. I was teaching math three for a while, and then I was teaching math three in the fall and staying with my student and teaching math CSD four in the winter. So that would allow me to keep my group, well, not all of the group, but like the, the most of them for a full year. So we were doing like math three in the fall and math CST4 together. So in math three, when we're doing uh, like uh, linear functions, uh, we are doing a uh, different activity in real life to, to illustrate uh, what a uh, linear function looks like. So we do uh, how tall is my teacher using uh, cups like uh, you know those beer pong cups so they're all excited when I bring the cups in uh, they think we're gonna play something fun 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 but they just have to imagine how tall I am and uh, create a graph of that and we also do the same thing with Barbie bungee so how many rubber bands do we need for Barbie to be thrown off the overpass without killing herself. So they have to extrapolate the number of um, rubber band they need. So they do the, ex the extrapolation in class, they stand up on desk and they try to figure out how many rubber band they need. Is it a constant uh, line? Depending if you're, they're using different size rubber band, they also have to figure that out. And then at the end of, uh, when everybody uh, is done working on their project, we go on the real actual overpass of the Victoria Bridge and we launched uh, Barbies from the bridge to see which team uh, got it okay and which Barbie died. So, and I use all of my daughter's Barbies that are now adult, so they don't need those Barbies anymore. And uh, they gladly lend them to me for the purpose of teaching math. Well, I'm, I'm really, really happy that you actually use this activity. Just to add on this, I had done a few activities similar to this, um, where I actually went and um, I asked the students to actually measure the school, physically measure with tape, and actually to get it to be drawn on a piece of paper. And they, they had a hard time to do that but with with the physical actually measurement and being able to work together they were able to get it on a scale and what we did is we went to the city hall and we got an engineer and an architect to actually look at their drawing and to show the real drawings of the school so that was a really really like interesting activity similar to the barbie uh Barbie the bunging and um, it was it, there's a lot of stuff we can do with manipulatives so yes. yeah so this one over here I, I found it interesting like just ask yourself which one would you rather do if you're a student would you want to do worksheet or would you want to do actually manipulative and if we just go around fast fast please in the chat which one would you prefer I see bees yeah yeah, but you know what? The funny part, I know some of us do like the A, <laughs> you know, coming from, let's say, like I had adult learners when I used to bring the manipulative and they used to look at me and like, ah, terrified. I don't need to do this. And, and those are the guys who needed the most. 
because when you're doing, I realize with, with my experience is when, when students like do a lot of worksheet, the minute they understand the procedural on how to resolve something, there's no more understanding is necessary. So you keep on doing the same thing over and over. You figure out like through pattern, if you're quick on your feet, you recognize the pattern, but you still apply the same procedure. Now, take a student who loves these worksheets and give them some manipulative like these toys and say, show me what you mean by this question. And some of them have a bit of trouble doing that because now it, it requires of them not only to apply a step-by-step -step process, it actually, they have to actually understand and they have to explain, which is a very, very difficult things to do if you're not trained to do so, right? So I find even if you get those students in your classroom that they come, let's say, especially I had older students who come from different countries, have different background of learning math, and this is the only way they know, when they come to actually where they have to explore through kinesthetic, like through through manipulatives, they find it very, very difficult. And that's where I, I personally think from a teaching perspective, I think these students needs it the most because this is where they develop communicating their thoughts, their use the language of math to explain and to actually check if they really understand or not, right? So that being said, um, Really, the use of manipulative has been recommended um, by expert, and there's many, many research. And once you get this presentation and you click on the, this is an active link, you'll see that there is actually, let me see if I could get you to it. There is actually a whole study that has been done. You, this is a uh, this is a ten page uh, summary of of the manipulative teach uh, manipulative to teach math concept aligned with research. So there's a lot a lot of research that has been done that to prove that the use of manipulative in math is really really useful. All right. And of course, the use of manipulative, it aligns with the curriculum. Remember the competency when you say represent a problem. This is one way of, of actually being able to represent. And the fact that it's motivating and engaging and it's fun, it, it may help in retention and may actually also help the students to break free from that for a moment. Sometimes they forget themselves that they're in math. And, and based on our students' profile, the fact that they were they failed math, they had a bad taste of a bad experience in math for so long, maybe starting off with a method that is less um, recognizable in their mind, it might actually throw them off to give it a second shot, right? And have better um, attitude towards it. So I think there's many, many benefits for that. Um, another thing also, I know there's um, some people still believes uh, there's what we call productive and unproductive beliefs. In, in when you were talking about manipulatives, some people believe when you're talking about manipulatives only for children, only for younger people who need some visuals, so the opportunity to manipulate, to move. And it's only a, an elementary, like a primary and elementary approach math approach, but truly is research has shown that students of all grade levels will benefit from that kind of um, that kind of approach. It, it, it just helps to kind of bridge the abstract of uh, the abstract part of math into something that can be more recognizable for for some students. Okay. Now, everybody, I'm sure heard of this. I hear, I forget, I see, I remember, I do, I understand. Well, there's nothing better than having that applied in a math class, right? Now, what's the big ideas that research actually tackled when they were studying manipulatives in math is that it makes sense um, of problems and, and help the students to persevere to, to solving them. When I give you a situation or a setup with manipulative, the student is not seeing that as a, as a, as a homework or as, it's more like, oh my God, I have to solve this. This is a game. I have to win at this. So it becomes more like a playful setup. So whatever that abstract concept that seemed only for, for other people who understand this, it becomes theirs. And they, 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 they don't even recognize that they're learning math, right? Um, also, it helps reason abstractly and quantitatively. So connect something that is so far away from you into something more quantitatively. 
and being able to construct viable argument and critique reasoning of others. So when, let's say you have a classroom and everybody, you give every, a problem to everybody and ask them to model it differently, you could ask, you could guide every student and uh, to share with others like why their model is better, justify their choices, how did they go about it? And those are all skills and competency that, that they need to develop, right? And also to model with ma mathematics, take something very complex and turn it into a model. It's, it's a skill. Um, look for and express regularly and repeated reasoning. So notice that there is a pattern. Mathematics has a lot of, uh, of patterns and recognizing these pattern you're building on relationships. So you can deduce a lot of reasoning that we usually just put on the board without necessarily them truly understanding. And my favorite of all is we're all different, we're all unique, we all have different learning styles. So giving the opportunity for the ones who are different to access that kind of learning too. Um, of course, there's four effective math teaching elements that is actually researched and tested and, and approved if you want. Um, explicit instruction with cumulative practice, visual representation, schema-based instruction, and peer interaction. We will only focus on the second one, the visual representation, and this is where I'm going to present you the model CRA. CRA is a model that, um, that is used um, in the teaching of math. Um, C stands for concrete, R for representational, and A is for abstract. So how is that applied in our classroom? How can we apply that in our classroom? When we're looking at a concrete approach, we're talking about the math manipulative being physical or virtual. We're actually starting to, to, to touch, to feel, to think, to, uh, to, to, to model uh, a problem, an idea. Then we go to the representation. That's where we use the drawing, the diagram, the tally mark, the Venn diagram, all kind of drawing methodology to, to transfer what we just discovered, explored into something like that could make sense in, to us. And only the abstract part only comes later where do you use actually the math language, which is the number and the symbols. And this actually, when I was looking, uh, looking into that, those research, it actually reminded me of the child's development. If you notice a child at the beginning part of their lives, they, 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 they use their hands. They, when they start crawling, they start walking, they want to touch, they want to smell, they want to feel, they're learning. They take the world as a wonder and the, everything is, is fair game, right? Because it's, 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 they're discovering all of that stuff. And, and when they get a bit like comfortable with that, then they start using the, the, the coloring pen and they make all these fun little pictures that to them make so much sense to us, it was like scribbles, but to them it makes sense, right? And eventually when they get to school age, when you start giving them like more structure, like they start learning the, the letters and the, the alphabet and the numbers and on. So if we take the same ideas and we bring it to our classroom to teach math, especially, especially the early stages of math, like the first cycle for the CCB, it, I think personally it'll benefit and it will benefit a lot of our students and we can fill in the gaps that they have because our students have lots and lots of gap of learning on top of learning challenges and, 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 and experience and lots of luggages on, on how they feel about the subject already. So this might ease them into, let's say something new, different, and fun. Math could be fun, actually, right? Um, other benefits that I that I thought would be beneficial for this method is also um, removing language barriers, uh, actually allowing the students to show you if they understand or not. We don't. This is a nice way, a very a very easy way to to sh to, to to allow the students to demo his thinking, his his logic, and to start with that and actually guide them in the direction you want them to 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 see it, right? Um, and sometimes they might surprise you with ideas that you never thought about. Like I never thought about it like that. And this is this is the fun part of actually allowing this kind of interactions, right? It's another tool to. It's another tool to their toolbox. They just have another way of kind of figuring out what to do if they're stuck, right? And this is a super opportunity for actually stimulating, uh, stimulate discussion and exchanges among students, right? And we all know through discussions and exchanges, that's how we learn. 
right? And the best part is stimulates creativity, right? Because that's how we evolved in math. It's through creativity. Is um, and and this is a super opportunity to allow the students to to develop that part, right? Now, any Michelin, questions so far? I, I was just gonna say, Micheline, the the chat is just full of good suggestions and the good comments and that on uh, what you're just talking about as whereas uh, like beyond learning styles uh, research you de demonstrate that multitudes of methods to learn is best and um, so all of these comments will be put uh, Julie's going to put them into um, she's going to put them into a google document which going to be which will be added to the Google Slides so people will have access to everything that's being written right now in the chat. Perfect, thank you so much. This no no yeah, problem. This is wonderful. So, so far it makes sense, right? So now, this is the fun part that I would like everybody, if you have a chance to have a piece of paper and a pen, a pencil, and actually simulate that, that, that process, okay? So uh, let's start off with something as simple as this. Um, comparing fraction. Okay, let me give you a task. Take your piece of paper, take a pencil, and please make two different fraction with the same denominator, but different numerator, right? I want you to compare the fractions, which one is largest, and how do you know? But I would like you to use the CRA model the concrete, so of course you will have to use a manipulative, let's assume you have a manipulative, okay? The representational part, where you actually represent it. And the abstract part is like, okay, what can you deduce by answering these questions? Okay, let's take a minute and do that, please. You know, this is what ideally, if that was like, um, if that was in a, in, a, in, a, in a class, I will ask everybody to share what they did, right? And, and this is the part where you could actually start a conversation. And this is where the part, the interesting questions come out and, and you can build on that. This is the part where it be, could become very interactive. So by giving them, let's say, a, a fraction sticks where they cut and put in an envelope and they could actually use from the weakest students in the class to the strongest students in your class could use these and, and sketch it on paper. They could even take these manipulative and put them together and actually redraw that model. And actually that's where you get to the abstract. So now the abstract part is you're putting it in number and symbols and you come about having this relationship. And that relationship actually emerged from the discussion by, you could ask anyone in the class and they'll be able to answer from a very, very simple answer to a very complex answer. And this is where it's fun. Everyone could give you, it's almost like it's designed in such that everyone is able to do a problem like that, right? So someone may just give you a simple answer by saying, well, okay, well, the two fourth is larger than the quarter. And I could show you, look, it's physically there. And that's why um, the quarter is less than the two quarters, right? And if we had many examples in the classroom, let's say of something like that, of an activity like that, and then we'll, we could ask, well, what can we deduce? What can we generalize out of this? What do we notice? What do we observe? Is there a pattern? And that could bring you to the next point is if the denominators are the same, then the largest denominator is greater is the fraction. Most of us, when we teach this typically, um, traditionally, is we put this on the board, we give them lots and lots of worksheet to practice, and believe me, I have some students in SEC 4, they still come to me and they say, well, miss, the opening of the sign, is it this way that means bigger or is it? And when you're like in SEC 4 and you're looking at the student and they're asking something as basic as this, you wonder how much do we really understand what they just asked, right? So that's where you still have students SEC 4 and SEC 5 that they will ask you something so basic. By doing an activity like this, they could get the chance to physically manipulate it, mentally take an image of it, and deduce the reasoning into something that makes sense to them. And the minute they connect it to something they know, they won't forget. 
they will forget, right? And unfortunately, right now in our math classes is the minute the class is over, it's like a delete button and we start the next class, right? Which is unfortunate. That's why we take five times the amount of time to finish any book because we never get to master anything, right? Or understand anything in depth. So that being said, now, let me give you another question, where is a small twist, right? So again, with the same exercise you have done on your piece of paper and pencil, make two different fractions with the same numerator, but different denominator. Compare your fraction, which one is larger, and how do you know using that model, right? So now if I ask any of you, every, everybody, um, is it easier to do it a second time? You just learned a new technique on how to go about looking at things. You just learned a new strategy, right? So again, you may use this time your fraction stakes, you may represent them and you may come with a, with a conclusion much faster because it took you a bit longer at the beginning to understand what's the process to get to that. The second time, again, if you had the weaker student still, but now he got a new technique under his belt, right? So three quarters larger than three fifths because three fifths is less than size. And that's a valid explanation, right? And again, if you had that group discussion, you could get to the part where if the numerator is the same, then the larger, the denominator, the smaller is the fraction. And this is a deduction that they could make on their own versus when we feed them this information, right? And they actually understood it. And in case they didn't, they could go back to the exercise and redo it so they could deepen their understanding of the concept. Now, let's go for another example, which is a bit more complex in terms of abstract, right? So when we're talking about variables, what does a variable really, really mean? We have all these definitions, but what does it really, really mean? So this is an activity you could like play with your student, and I'm sure card games is, is very, very popular at uh, any levels in our uh, uh, centers, uh, uh, math grades, right? So you play a card of 21, including the Joker cards in the deck. Take a picture of three hands with the Joker in them. Now, this is where questioning becomes interesting. What is the value of the Joker in each hand? Are they the same? And how can you teach the role of the Joker to a colleague? So take a minute to think about it. And let's go through the, the exercise together using CRA also. Now, let's take a look at this. Um, they played a game, it's fun, they take a picture, they upload it, right? Mm -hmm. Now, that, the C part, the concrete part is the game itself, right? Now, the, 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 the representation part is actually the display of these cards into a graph, right? Being a picture, being a graph, being whatever you want it to, to, uh, to, uh, to use, right? The student use. And then it's easy if you give them a, a hand, uh, like um, a deck of cards and tell them a hand and what's the value of the Joker being the first image or the last image, they easily will identify the value. Oh, well, J, of course, in this case, J is 10, here is eight, here is four, right? But through the art of discussion, that's where you're gonna bring the point as, okay, Joker is a Joker, right? So how come the Joker has different values, right? Well, because, well, the joker means I could take any value it, it want, depending on the, the, where it is, right? So it's, it's, um, it's a space holder. Well, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. The joker is a space holder, right? So in math, the joker is our variable. So all our variable when we use in equations are jokers, right? So by connecting this, then it becomes easier to understand what the deeper meaning of what is like X, even though it's an abstract component, okay? So these are just ideas of how you could take a concept and, and turn it into a game and get a deeper understanding of it to let the student connect to it and make sense of it in their own way, all right? Now, because of our situation, it just, um, of COVID-19, <laughs> right? It accelerated the process of virtual learning, right? So this is the part that we actually now could transfer a lot of these activities virtually, and we could actually use um, 
some tools online that's available to us to help us to, to get that deep understanding, even with these tools. So before I pass uh, the, uh, the the floor to to Louise to go uh, to guide us through this this platform, is there any question about the in class activities, the hands on approach? Varan, you have a question before? Uh, yeah. So nowadays we are all teaching online. Mm -hmm. So how we can uh, make these manipulatives? Uh, like appear online so that the hands-on experience, I know we cannot do it, mm -hmm. um, but how can it be transcended into the online mode where it will give almost um, similar kind of experience? A very, very, very good question. And I'm gonna show you, I have compiled a list of resources, being e low tech and, and of course, if you want high tech to be used online um, that we will be going through. But now Louise is gonna use something, the, the, this um, similar, um, similar method, but now using graspable math, like teaching algebra. But now we're going to use question to guide the students, and you'll see she'll she'll demo it for you. But when we come back to when we, when we'll get to the resources, I will show you how we could use these activities online. Okay. Thank you. Je vais faire la présentation en français. Je vais pas parler trop vite, mais l'interface de l'application que je vais montrer est en anglais. Donc, en voyant mes actions, si vous perdez des mots. Vous allez au moins voir ce que je suis en train de faire. Puis, vous pouvez euh, interrompre n'importe quand aussi si vous avez besoin d'une traduction. Et plusieurs personnes vont pouvoir s'en charger. Ça va? Euh, J'ai vu qu'il y a plusieurs personnes qui, euh, qui avaient dit qu avait, que, que vous connaissez euh, Grasse Pebble Math. Donc, pour certains, ça risque d'être un petit peu une... Euh, euh, bon, du déjà vu, mais je vais montrer des applications en particulier. C'est certain que je ne fais pas une formation sur le logiciel, euh, mais plus le type de manipulation qu'on peut faire. Euh, vous pouvez le faire en même temps que moi si vous avez deux écrans. Ça se fait aussi sur euh, tablette. Euh, le logiciel, euh, quand vous arrivez sur Grasp Pebble Map, j'ai mis euh, le lien dans le clavardage. Vous avez euh, les outils ici euh, d'apprentissage dans l'onglet en haut, Learn. Vous avez plusieurs tutoriels et vous avez aussi euh, les gestes, dont euh, des activités pour apprendre la gestuelle du logiciel. Parce que des fois, euh, on hésite un petit peu comment euh, faire avec les différents... Euh, avec les, les euh, différentes gestuelles. Pour euh, aller au Canva, là, il y a deux outils dans Grasp Pebble Math. Il y a l'outil Activité que je vais montrer un petit peu tout à l'heure, puis il y a l'outil Explore Algebra. Ça, c'est le Canva. Donc, en cliquant sur euh, Explore Algebra, vous ouvrez le Canva. Vous avez une fenêtre blanche avec en haut à gauche des outils d'édition et en haut à droite, des outils plus de gestion. Vous pouvez euh, vous créer un compte, c'est gratuit. Ce n'est pas un logiciel libre comme tel, mais c'est un logiciel euh, gratuit qui est produit par euh, des, euh, des chercheurs universitaires. Le compte peut, écrire, peut être créé avec euh, votre compte Google ou un autre compte. Et l'avantage d'avoir un compte, c'est que vous pouvez euh, sauvegarder vos activités et aussi les partager à des élèves, les partager ou euh, les partager aussi par euh, Google Classroom et d'autres outils. Pour insérer des objets mathématiques, vous avez insert ici, vous pouvez insérer des expressions mathématiques, des fonctions, du texte, des vidéos YouTube. Donc, vous pouvez avoir une vidéo qui exprime le problème ou une vidéo qui explique comment faire. Et vous avez trois fenêtres possibles pour euh, euh, des graphiques. Ce sont les euh, fenêtres, les, euh, les applications de GeoGebra. Si vous connaissez un peu, vous allez les reconnaître assez bien. Je vais commencer avec euh, une, une expression mathématique. Ici aussi, on a euh, la configuration pour un clavier avancé et un clavier débutant. 
Je vais travailler avec le clavier avancé, mais je vais basculer au clavier débutant tout à l'heure pour montrer la différence avec les deux. Je vais partir avec une simple addition parce qu'un des problèmes avec les, euh, avec les élèves, souvent, c'est qu'ils ont de la difficulté avec euh, l'égalité. Souvent, quand on enseigne euh, l'égalité au primaire, on ne va pas enseigner comme une égalité. Le symbole égal veut plutôt euh, vouloir dire un résultat. Puis quand les, les élèves arrivent avec l'algèbre, là, ils vont voir à passer le signe égalité. Ils ne comprennent pas bien parce que l'égalité pour eux, c'est pour donner une réponse. Et non, on a deux termes qui ont la même valeur. Pour les plus jeunes ou pour les, euh, les élèves qui, sont, qui ont des difficultés, qui sont en pré-secondaire, je ne sais pas comment on appelle le euh, secteur anglophone, ceux qui sont euh, de niveau pré-secondaire. Pre-sec, pre-secondary. Sec, yeah. Literacy, pre-secondary and secondary. Donc, ça peut être bien pour eux de revenir, avant de commencer l'algèbre, ou s'ils commencent l'algèbre et ont des difficultés, de revenir à la manipulation des simples égalités. Je vais partir avec une égalité. Bon, 5 plus 3, je pourrais dire, est égal à 6 plus 2. Donne. Ici, l'opération, quand on passe la souris dessus, quand le curseur devient comme une croix, ici, on peut déplacer. Ici, l'égalité, le symbole égal, si je clique une fois sur le symbole, j'inverse les deux termes. Ça, c'est une grosse difficulté. C'est quelque chose qui est mal compris quand les élèves font l'algèbre. Si le X est à droite au lieu d'être à gauche, ça leur cause un problème. Donc, de, de, de montrer aux élèves qu'on peut manipuler comme ça. On a une touche aussi qui s'appelle, un outil qui s'appelle Keypad, qui me permet de modifier la valeur d'un des termes. Si je sélectionne 6, je peux dire qu'est-ce qui donne 6. Donc, 6, ça peut être 5 plus 1. Je peux utiliser le clavier ici ou mon clavier d'ordinateur. Et revenir ici, je retrouve l'égalité. Et je peux descendre pour voir les étapes. Je pourrais aussi faire une copie. C'est-à-dire que je peux faire une opération sur les deux termes. À ce moment-là, j'ai... Je, laisse le, je clique sur le symbole égal et je laisse trois secondes. Et je peux faire une opération sur les deux termes de l'égalité. Je peux faire n'importe quelle opération. Je vais faire une opération simple. Je vais ajouter une valeur. Je vais dire, par exemple, plus 7. Donc, le thème se rajoute des deux côtés. Je peux déplacer, Oops. déplacer, différents termes. Je pourrais dire ici, je veux arriver à 10 plus 5. Est-ce que je peux faire 10 plus 5 de l'autre côté ici? Comment faudrait-je que je m'y prenne pour faire 10 plus 5? Avec Kepad. Donc, ça devient un défi aux élèves. Je veux avoir 10 plus 5 ici. L'autre façon qu'on peut faire aussi, c'est d'utiliser les, les boîtes. Là, vous voyez ici, je ne vais pas tout le temps utiliser insert. Je fais juste comme appuyer n'importe où avec le clic gauche de la souris. Puis, je vais chercher mon clavier. Je peux utiliser aussi les boîtes. La boîte vide me permet de faire différentes opérations. Donc, ce que je vais faire, c'est que je vais donner un défi. Je vais dire, je vais prendre un nombre, n'importe quel nombre, je prends 24. Puis ensuite, je vais demander à l'élève de faire une expression qui va donner 24. L'élève, s'il sait, il pourrait utiliser simplement cliquer dans la boîte, remplacer ses valeurs, puis de faire une expression.
je pourrais lui donner une expression un peu plus compliquée. Puis là, je lui dis, ça, ça doit donner 24. Donc là, il doit aller vraiment, il peut utiliser... C'est bête que mon keypad ne fonctionne plus. Là, il pourrait vraiment utiliser la touche keypad quand elle fonctionne. C'est la première fois que ça m'arrive qu'elle qu ne fonctionne plus comme ça. Et d'aller faire des euh, différents calculs, donc de, de dire qu'est-ce qui va me donner 24 en addition. Il pourrait dire que 24, ça pourrait être... Un plus 4. Évidemment, je le mettrais comme ça. Là, ensuite, je pourrais dire 20, ça peut être 2 fois 10. Je l'ai réessayé. J'ai toujours espoir que ça fonctionne. Mais non. Donc, je vais réessayer. 20, ça me donnerait 2 fois 10. Puis après ça, le 10, je pourrais faire. Par exemple, 15 moins 5. Mm -hmm. là, en décomposant comme ça, on peut lui dire, va chercher, en fait, viens remplacer ici pour euh, que 24 s'exprime dans une euh, expression euh, mathématique. Donc, c'est comme l'inverse de travailler les priorités d'opération. Au lieu de dire, quand on fait euh, les priorités d'opération, il faut commencer par les parenthèses, après ça, bon, les multiplications, divisions. Ici, on fait l'inverse. Puis là, ça va amener l'élève à comprendre pourquoi la multiplication d'un nombre ici, pourquoi est-ce que je mets la parenthèse? Parce que là, si je veux remplacer 10 par 15 moins 5, il va falloir que je mette une parenthèse. C'est ce qui va donner le sens, en fait, aux priorités d'opération. Et que là, après ça, il pourrait l'essayer. Si je mets 2, ici je mets 15. On peut enlever là, les parenthèses aussi, là, parce que là, je ne l'ai pas dans la configuration. Puis là, ici, l'élève, quand on lui fait déjà les problèmes, là, c'est là qu'on peut aller dans les settings et dire pour débutants. Puis là, on peut voir que le clavier est beaucoup plus simple. Donc, pour un élève qui est au niveau présecondaire, on peut lui donner l'activité comme ça. Ça, c'est un, une des façons de travailler pour manipuler. On peut travailler aussi avec les fractions. Les fractions s'expriment, euh, la division s'exprime toujours en fractions. Si je dis 3 huitièmes, plus, par exemple, un quart. L'élève, s'il arrive pour additionner, ça ne fonctionnera pas. Il peut mettre les fractions au même dénominateur en laissant le curseur en appuyant longuement sur la barre de fraction et en disant par quel facteur on va multiplier. Puis ensuite, il fait ses multiplications et il peut additionner. Au niveau des manipulations, on peut aussi travailler avec les graphiques. Si j'insère la fenêtre géométrie, je vais la déplacer ici. Je ne sais pas si parce que je suis en plein écran que ça ne fonctionne pas. Ah, c'est ça. Je pourrais faire un segment. Le segment a une euh, grandeur, a une taille, une longueur. Je peux sortir la valeur ici. Quelle serait la longueur d'un segment qui a un tiers de cette mesure-là? Je pourrais appeler mon segment A égale un tiers de F. Non. 
Il a fallu que je mette mon curseur à côté, là, vous avez vu. Pour un F. Et F, je peux venir le remplacer ici. Et c'est interactif. Donc, je peux venir aussi mettre ma mesure. Comme ça, excusez. Donc, le A, j'ai la mesure ici. Et je pourrais aller chercher le segment qui a cette longueur-là. Quand on parlait tout à l'heure de comparer deux fractions qui ont le même dénominateur puis pas le même numérateur, etc., donc on peut les reporter comme longueur de segment. Ici, je sais que mon segment A, ici, il y a un tiers de F. Si j'en fais un qui a deux tiers, il va être quelle grandeur? C'est des façons de manipuler en utilisant euh, le logiciel de grasse pebble on peut euh, parfois penser que c'est un logiciel qui, euh, qui est compliqué pour les élèves. Mais en fait, à chaque fois qu'on a mis ça entre les mains des élèves, j'ai quand même fait des tests beaucoup avec Aspebel et avec, euh, avec GeoGebra. Les élèves arrivent très rapidement à euh, manipuler les différents outils, sont assez à l'aise. Puis, comme on l'a vu aussi tout à l'heure, dans le logiciel, dans l'onglet « Learn », on peut aller voir différentes vidéos pour apprendre à manipuler. Uh, I would like to add something to what, uh, what uh, Louise was just saying. I think even if, let's say, you're not comfortable using this, you could use it almost as a support to your student. I know some teachers use it, like they give them like their worksheet or whatever, and they, they, they allow them to use this software, this, this, this app, To, to actually support their, their learning. And believe it or not, students, they learn it a lot faster and they actually find tricks and all kinds of things. They'll do so much with this that you don't have to always put it on you to learn the software, to teach it. It's, you're not teaching the software, you're just giving the student the tool for the ones who requires this kind of manipulative to, 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 to get uh, fired up about math. So you can use it as like just a tool and let the student discover it on their own as much as you, if you're comfortable with it and you play with it and you want to use it also in your teaching, you could do that. So you could give the option of just allowing, like giving it to the student to discover or to use it in your, learn, uh, in your teaching. I just wanted to add that. On peut l'utiliser un petit peu. Um, oui. Does it require a computer or does it work on tablet well enough? Euh, euh, Louise, il dit, est-ce que ça peut être utilisé sur une tablette, un téléphone, euh, n'importe quoi, ou c'est juste un ordi? Euh, ce n'est pas une application sur euh, la tablette, mais euh, si la tablette, on peut utiliser Internet, on a accès à Internet. Donc, euh, moi, je l'ai essayé sur iPad. Sur, sur un, un cellulaire, ça fonctionne aussi, mais la manipulation avec les doigts, c'est un, euh, un peu difficile. Mais sur la tablette, ça va vraiment bien. Okay. Sur so, un iPad ou tablette, ça va bien. Yeah. So you could use it on a tablet, you use it on a phone, as long as you have internet connection. The, the only thing is the manipulation. If you, you want to use your fingers to manipulate these tools, it's a bit difficult. But I guess uh, some stylus, maybe if you have it, the, the student has a stylus, it should be okay. And it's funny, they find a way. Uh, I had students who took a whole class virtually on their phone and they're able to do it. So it's funny, their fine motor skills become ex extremely well-developed. That's what I know. <laughs> I don't know if that helps. Je vais montrer des, des uh, fonctionnalités dans les, uh, dans les CT, la configuration. Um, C'est important de les regarder par rapport à notre intention pédagogique. Ici, on peut sélectionner, comme je vous ai montré, pour avancer aux débutants. Mais on peut aller aussi à la carte pour euh, cocher ou décocher les différentes fonctions. Vous prendrez le temps de les lire, mais je vais vous en montrer un en particulier que je trouve vraiment, vraiment important. 
c'est celui-ci. C'est surtout quand on commence à enseigner l'algèbre. Souvent, on va enseigner l'algèbre. Je vais le garder comme ça. Voilà. Si je fais une opération algébrique, souvent, on va montrer aux élèves quand on prend une valeur et on la change de côté, elle change de signe. Euh, ici, bon, j'ai mis la bonne configuration, mais souvent, la, la, dans les configurations ici, ici, j'ai juste dragging. Si j'avais sélectionné celui-ci, je vais reprendre la même opération, vous allez voir la différence. Il ne fait pas l'opération de soustraire les deux côtés. Puis ça, c'est un raccourci que l'élève, en fait, il ne fait pas toujours le lien. C'est pour ça que le montrer de cette façon-là, si on ne change pas par défaut, il sait euh, « dragging », à ce moment-là, l'élève, il ne voit pas pourquoi, quand on déplace ou on change un, un nombre de l'autre côté du égal, ça change de signe. Ici, on le voit bien. Puis, on peut sélectionner aussi « premier ». Là, il ne peut pas le changer. Ça ne fonctionne pas. Il faut qu'il fasse lui-même l'opération inverse. Donc, il faut appuyer trois secondes sur le égal et qu'il fasse lui-même moins 5. Donc, il y a les trois options. Donc, dépendamment de l'intention pédagogique, on commence à enseigner l'algèbre aux élèves. Donc, de ne pas avoir cette option-là. Il faut vraiment qu'ils puissent voir soit euh, que le logiciel le fasse puis que là, ils s'aperçoivent de l'opération qu'il y a derrière ou soit qu'on lui dit « Trouve toi-même l'opération que tu dois faire pour isoler la valeur. » Quand on fait euh, des activités, je pourrais donner euh, des problèmes à résoudre et le partager aux élèves. Le fichier que je vais leur envoyer, le lien que je vais leur envoyer en partage, il va inclure la configuration que j'ai choisie. Donc, l'élève va avoir la bonne configuration au moment où je lui partage. Quand on dit à l'élève, va sur l'application et euh, écris toi-même tes activités, à ce moment-là, il faut s'assurer de le configurer avec l'élève pour que ça soit configuré correctement. Puis, il reste une dernière option. Je vous avais parlé euh, sur... Euh, euh, la page d'accueil, il y a aussi les activités. Pour les activités, il y a deux options. On peut euh, s'inscrire comme étudiant ou comme enseignant. Je vais vous montrer une première activité qui est moi comme enseignant. Je, vous, je vais vous mettre le lien dans euh, le, le clavardage, dans le chat. Puis là, vous voyez... Vous, vous allez y aller comme élève. Puis, dans mon partage d'écran, vous allez voir ce que l'enseignant voit. Donc, vous allez voir les personnes arriver. Je vais mettre à jour. Ah, ah. voilà. Tout le monde vient d'arriver. <rire> Il y a cinq personnes d'arrivée. Vous allez voir que vous avez deux tâches à faire. Puis, l'enseignant peut voir, je peux cacher ça, je pense, peut voir les euh, personnes qui sont en train de travailler et en direct aussi ce que la personne fait. Ce qui est intéressant, c'est que quand les élèves sortent, l'enseignant conserve toutes les traces du travail qui a été fait par les élèves. Je peux avoir la progression aussi de chacun qui est en train de faire quelle tâche. Là, je vous ai mis que des canevas, mais il y a différents autres types de tâches qu'on peut euh, créer aussi.
Là, j'ai cliqué sur Julie. Je peux voir les statistiques. <rire> là, ce n'est pas des tâches autocorrectrices qui s'autocorrigent. C'est juste des tâches de développement. Donc, c'est certain qu'il n'y aurait pas de résultat ici. Mais je peux avoir des tâches avec des euh, bonnes réponses à obtenir. Donc, ça les calculerait également. Puis là, je peux aller voir le travail de Julie. Puis si Julie dit « j'y arrive pas, je ne sais pas quoi faire », là, Julie, je fais un partage d'écran avec elle. Julie, tu vois, ton, euh, tu vois mon écran. Je peux lui expliquer. Prends la tâche qui est panne. Clique ici. Trouve un nombre qui peut être remplacé 45, qui a la même valeur que 45 avec n'importe quelle opération. Puis là, il faut toujours que tu aies en tête la réponse ici. Là, je lui explique comme ça en partage d'écran. Puis dès qu'elle reprend puis commence à le faire, tout ce que j'ai fait s'efface. Et vous voyez, vous êtes à distance avec un élève qui a des difficultés à faire une tâche. Vous pouvez juste partager un canevas, puis en partage d'écran comme ça, expliquer à l'élève ce qu'il y a à faire. On peut donner un exemple aussi. On dit à tout le monde arrêter. Ici, en fait, il faudrait que je commence tout de suite par ma multiplication. Je pourrais remplacer 63 par une multiplication qui pourrait être 3 fois 21. Oui, puis là, il nous arrête quand on fait des erreurs à cette multiplication-là, si j'ai bien compris. Euh, il faut remplacer euh, par une valeur qui est égale. De le faire. Là, c'est parce que je ne suis pas sur ma page, là, mais normalement, il faudrait que je remplace par une valeur qui est égale. Je ne peux pas remplacer par quelque chose qui n'est pas égal. Je ne peux pas l'effacer. Ici, c'est marqué, il faut substituer 63 avec une expression équivalente. Peut-être je pourrais le faire comme ça. 3, ouais, 3 fois 21. Fait que là, ça fonctionne. Puis là, après ça, c'est le 21 que je vais remplacer par une soustraction. Qu'est-ce qui donnerait 21 en soustraction? Je voudrais dire... Euh, tu as une idée? 22 moins. Allez, avec 22 moins 1. <rire> Donc là, on a le, la séquence. Qu'on peut vérifier après. Je pourrais même le vérifier de différentes façons puis de dire que ça fonctionne quand même. Voilà. Sylvain a bien réussi. La tâche 2, ben, c'est une tâche avec... Euh, à l'inverse, on a l'opération, la même opération avec des fractions, puis il faut arriver à la réponse. Je vais arrêter mon partage d'écran. Ça faisait pas mal le tour de ce que je voulais, euh, je voulais vous montrer. Do you have any question to Louise? I think it's marvelous. Thank you. Like when you try to do the plus before time just goes no, no, no. And you try to do mistakes and it, it sort of guides you for doing the right thing. And I think it's pretty neat. Yeah, but what's really interesting also to add to what you just said is you could make it as simple as, as complicated. You could put restraint, constraints. You could push the student to go from like really like from beginner stages to more advanced stages by adding more and more constraints, which I find very interesting. Yeah, removing the crushes. Yeah. Slowly. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I, I also find that students often, I'm sorry to say, but they're lazy. They don't want to do like all the different steps, but now being done on the screen for them, like it, it, it actually, they, it can, they can decompose and you can see the whole process. I think it, they're going to use it more. It gives them an example of how it should look like in the end. Yeah. And to check if their steps are right too. Yeah. 
I'm sure we can do it in paper. And then once once they practice enough, they do it like the first one on paper, and then they go back to see if they have the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's why I know of a teacher who is using it only as like a, a checking me mechanism because she's not comfortable using all this technology, but then she'll tell the students, okay, you did it, go check it. And they're so, they, they find this so fun to, to actually see all their work displayed and they're, che oh, I missed this step. I have to rewrite it here or fix it here. And the more they do it, you know, they don't want to do the papers anymore. They just want to stick to. <laughs> well, I have a few students who check using the, there's one that you can just take a picture of the equation and it solves it, but I think it's more interactive this way. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, there's benefit to everything. Remember, all this technology is to help these kids figuring it out. It's not the other way around, right? So uh, whatever it takes to get them uh, geared up for this. So if there's no more question, I would like to go back uh, to, to, uh, to the presentation. Is that okay? Okay. So let me go back. Thank you, Louise. So I know some of our centers um, are still like in, in class. Some they use hybrid, some they use blended, some they use all kind of learning models. So just to clarify, when we're talking about hybrid model, we're talking about uh, students, um, all our students, half of them are in class, half of them are remotely, and they're taught simultaneously. So the teacher has to manage online and in class learning. And I know of some centers that they function this way and the teachers find this extremely, extremely difficult because they don't have the tools. When we started off, well, some centers started off this way, they didn't have the tools. So they, they kind of had to uh, put some people on weight and people were frustrated, but now they're in, in better shape to have the tools to, to actually administer the same activity online and virtually. Um, and Varen, when you asked me for the, uh, the the question, how can I do this virtually? I'm gonna I'm gonna show you in a bit how what kind of tools you could use. Okay. Uh, for um, in blended, when we're talking about blended model, we're talking about um, when you have um, it's a com it's a combination really between in person teaching and asynchronous learning method. So you have some days you're in class with the students, and some days you're online with the students. Some days you just give them assignments online. Um, to do on their own. So blended mean is just using different uh, way of teaching with the students being virtual or, or independent or um, in class. Okay. So at this point being blended or being, being, um, being um, hybrid, the teacher has lots and lots of choices um, and will use these tools according to what's the purpose of her lesson. Right now, how do we use these manipulatives? All these manipulatives are great, but if they're not used regularly as like second nature to these students, uh, they lose their use. It's not, it's not a novelty. It's not something, a new toy that we play with and throw. It becomes like a learning tool. To become a learning tool, you have to use it regularly. All right. Um, ideally, these tools should be given to the students with a bit of time for them to play with, where there's no teaching, just get them to explore, to play with, to discover, to, to tinker with them before the teaching comes in. Because we know when there's teaching with these tools initially, the students kind of try, want to mimic you. They were trying to find a a process, a recipe. They, they look for that. And if and if it's done before giving them the chance to actually um, figure things out, uh, the chances of them wanting to replicate what you do is going to be very, very high. All right. Um, also, to include these manipulative in their solution, to make it part of their thinking process, and the more they practice, the more it becomes second nature to them. All right. And to use these manipulative also of a way of con uh, conversation or writing show them a, a demo of, of, a, of a setup with manipulative and give them the, the chance to have these conversation and to transcribe this into something, into writing, or even like describe the steps or how would you go about it or how would you justify this, right? Um, and in doing, in, in practicing this, this methodology, you're actually bringing, uh, you're connecting more abstract math 
to more hands-on approaches. So the math, the manipulative will serve the math in making them more concrete and making them more real to the students versus, oh, it's just a theory I'm learning that I'm never going to use, right? How many questions is why am I learning this, you know, versus if it was under a game format or, or a challenge, you'll never hear it. It'll be just for fun and that will be enough. Now, I got the question uh, previously when I was preparing this workshop is like, how would you create these activities? And honestly, um, I always go back uh, as a trick that I use uh, in creating these activities is actually to have a very, very clear um, definition of what are you planning to achieve? What's, what am I trying to actually teach the students? What concept am I actually tackling with the student? It's really, really important to have that clear in your mind. And secondary, then I go through, okay, what am I actually getting the students to show me? Am I asking them to remember a fact? Are you, am I asking them to understand the concept? Am I asking them to apply? Am I asking them to analyze? What am I asking them to do? And this is how I build my activities. And I usually try to build it up in stages, in steps, right? And start off with something and build on it, right? And um, notice over here, you have two Bloom taxonomy. One was the typical one, it's in 1959. And then the next one is a revised version of it, which was done in 2001. Um, and this revision was necessary and was done by actually sim uh, some of the people who, were, who created that first model. And it was necessary to be aligned with the new program. Notice that the, the words that's been using in two, the two pyramids, one is nouns versus the other one in action. And notice competency, we're, we're actually evaluating a process, a thinking process. So we, 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 we will be analyzing more an action of doing something. Um, so this is how I go about it. Identify clearly my objective, my teaching objective. And now again, now what am I expecting the students to give me this objective? through? Is it through remembering something? Is it through creating? Am I giving them something to analyze? I want them to critically think. So I will rely on this to create my activity. Now, of course, the most effective pedagogical tool is the art of questioning, right? Um, and I found it really, really interesting when you're, you're sitting with the student trying to figure out what they know and how you teach them is we miss a lot of, we miss a lot of understanding how, where they come from by not questioning them. So I came across um, this, this uh, I compiled these, um, these kind of questions that might help you um, maybe guide the students. And again, please use this as a guide, as a reference. This is not a recipe. So let's say you have students that have difficulty starting a, a task. What kind of question you could actually guide them to start working, start their work? So how would you, how are you planning to tackle this? What information you have? So you're guiding them. So these are kind of questions that you could kind of have with your students to get them started. Here, these are type of questions that you may wanna use when you're checking progress. Like, you know, uh, can you explain? How far are you? What else can you do? So while they're doing the task, you could guide them with these questions. And if a student's who's stuck, what kind of questions you could ask? Can you describe this in your words? Like, uh, can you talk to me about uh, what you've done so far? Like, you know, so you could kind of see where they're, 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 they're having an issue with. Right, and of course, uh, the the questions after at the end after the class after the lesson where you go, okay, did you get the uh, did you get the right answer? Well, not the right answer. We should never say that. Did you get your answer? Uh, did you check? Did it answer the question? Does it make sense? Uh, uh, could you? What could you try next? Is there uh, something you um, you want to retain from this? What's the process you went about? What can you keep similar? Like, what can you do again in the future? What can you change in the future? These are more the the um, the in-depth question that makes the students reflect. And this you'll have access to uh, also to take away for you, um, like you know, just to refer to if you need to. Um, I just came across this that I thought was like, it's something interesting to keep in mind, food for thoughts. Uh, we know that under the umbrella of playing, 
in the spirit of games and, and having fun, we lose, we win, we're okay. It is fun, it's part of the game. We keep trying, we observe, we ask questions, we continue to play the game because it's part of that atmosphere, welcoming, inclusive, a secure uh, atmosphere. But in most math classes, I feel that our students look at, if I win, I pass, if I lose, I fail. And the losing feeling seems to be more recurring than the winning one. So there's something maybe we could bring into class to maybe change this. Okay. Um, this is the part that I'm really, really happy to share with you. Okay. And um, I put together some resources to help you out. I know as a teacher, this is something that I was sometimes uh, wanting, um, was looking for, is like a form of progression of learning. So these are the three, um, the CCB is actually separated in three sections, literacy, pre-secondary and secondary. I separated the courses, um, I'm only, I only included here the, the uh, progression of learning for only numeracy and arithmetic. By next workshop, I'm going to include the, um, the basic geometry also. And notice over here, you have the course code with the concept and the compulsory essential knowledge acquired in previous courses and what you need to teach presently. So how to connect the what you need to teach comparatively to the previous. So literacy, obviously, is the starting point. So there's no previous courses. You're so everything here you have is all concepts you need to teach. Now you move to money. Some of the concepts that you taught in that course, they come back and they're connected to others. Same thing here. When you move to pre-secondary, notice that there's some uh, essential knowledge that was taught in the previous courses that you could find in literacy. And on these, you're building new essential knowledge. Again, and we go all the way to secondary, the same thing as a list of, of uh, essential knowledge that you need to know and where they're connected and where these essential knowledge are being taught, okay? So that's one resource I thought might be interesting. This is another resource that I put together that um, I hope it may, um, you may use. So notice over here, this is the toolbox that I will be uh, updating in the uh, presentation and this uh, will give you access to all of these in-class activities, okay? So like the variables, similar terms, writing expression, direct and indirect, more or less. And I included over here also a virtual of manipulative that you have access to, to videos and website. And this document will be will be put on the website for uh, if anybody find other websites, anybody find other videos, any other games that you would like to share, so for example, here, you'll notice the variable activity over here and it's done differently. Uh, you have similar and like term that you may take this activity and actually use it in your class to get inspired, uh, which one are like terms. And again, using CRA methodology, now writing expression by, you could have it in levels, meaning um, starting off uh, with, uh, let's say, the beginning levels where you just have uh, numbers, no, no pictures in your deck, like take a deck of card and then introduce addition, subtraction, multiplication, division by just playing with cards and then eventually moving into adding, uh, adding the colors as a restriction, saying the, the signs of the cards becomes like, let's say, black is... Uh, positive, red is negative, <clears throat> and then you try to use sign law, and eventually including the pictures, sorry, including the pictures in your in your exercise, in your game, where the pictures becomes variables, and then you start writing expressions, okay? So um, a direct and indirect relationship, where you just give them statement, and you get them to think about the statement. Uh, is it a direct link? Is it an indirect link, right? And having that as a game card. And eventually when we get to the, uh, the the representation part, they could start using graphs. And you know how useful that is eventually. Um, you can use more or less, again, different quantities um, using this in manipulative. Um, what's the numerical value of each shape, giving them um, like equations in different form to, to figure out. 
uh, equivalence, like saying, okay, you have two jars and each jar is there's these three numbers. What can I move from, what two numbers I can move around to have the same quantity? So that's a game for, for equivalency. So if I take the two over here and I take the six over here, would they be equal quantities in both jars? So that becomes like an interesting challenge in, in also decomposing and, and equivalency. Um, this I found an interesting activity saying, well, how uh, as many ways as possible. So I represent this rational number is in as many ways as possible. So that gives the chance for the students to actually break it apart um, and write it in different ways. Um, uh, activity number nine, I find it extremely interesting. It's truth or dare where in the truth, you're giving them a statement where they have to say it's true or not. And this is where you actually um, ask them question on con conceptual questions versus when we're talking about dare, you're asking them to solve, to analyze, to justify, and to create a question. For example, you say, show me how can, uh, can we write 25 plus 3x in three different ways. Um, okay. 2x plus 5 equals 10, x is 5. Why is it wrong or why is it right? Um, what is the value of y? And create an expression with three terms, two with the same variable. One out of the three uh, terms has negative coefficients. So again, so you're, you're going into more of the higher thinking kind of questions. So these are only suggestion. Um, another one, you could ask them to analyze analyze this, follow, uh, this following solution and tell me where Sam went wrong. So you give them like a solution and you make intentionally you put mistakes and let them go over it and step by step um, trying to, to figure out where it went wrong, right? Uh, there's matching game. You give them the answers and you ask them to, 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 to match them up, right? So yeah, all they have to do now, they have to work on the process of doing that. So these are all ideas that you that you could use in your classrooms. Um, this is the, the 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 interesting part is for the manipulative uh, um, the manipulative uh, the virtual manipulative. And I had created over here. If you click on it, you'll get into um, a manipulative template that I I I you guys could use the way you want. And this manipulative template, like this is an uh, editable template. So you could put whatever questions you want, whatever. And over here, you could get your students to actually use these manipulative based on the question you want to put. So you could use this as a, as a, as a, as a form, uh, you know, uh, in your PowerPoints, uh, editable template in term like, you know, where you place value. And again, here you could use all of these manipulative, um, sorry, it's just a drop and drag uh, kind of uh, tools to, to, to use within your teaching. So um, here again, I'll let you discover it, but just to give you an idea. So when we're talking about like, uh, you could move stuff around and test it. So these are manipulative that you could also take this template and put in your PowerPoint and get the students to play with it. Um, I included you other, uh, other temp, uh, other manipulative that you may use, like number lines, and you could have, you know, the jumps and the starting point, the ending point, if you want to do addition, subtraction. So these are all like, you know, um, basic, basic, um, basic templates that may, you may want to use. And notice over here, I categorize for you all kind of games by topic and how they could be used. Like for example, here, a template, you know, the number line template, if you wanna include this in your teaching also. So it will take you to an app where you could have the number line and you could decide if you want it uh, in decimals and fraction, how you want it. And what's nice about it, you could actually, um, you know, like place it, you can manipulate it and such, like you wanna make it smaller, bigger, um, you know, uh, you wanna you wanna multiply, you wanna divide. You have all kind of interesting things that you can use with this. Okay, so I would let you discover this on your own. You know, again, if you're interested, a FET there is FET. I included uh, Jeopardy, recall activities, GeoGebra, Algebra, 
and Jamboard. I have thanks to um, Jessica. She she uh, she has done an activity on Jamboard on order of operation because one of her students um, had just a struggle with it, and she was kind enough to kind of donate it to our bank. So if you if you have a if you have an activity you want to share with everybody, you're more than welcome to fill it up. So this is only a starting point, and hopefully this this uh, resource will grow. You have also, I gave you the questionnaires, the newsletter that I would like everybody, if you have a chance to, uh, to subscribe, this is to give you access to all the news that's happening around and everything that's coming from the ministry, any new exams, any new documents. So if you wanna keep up with what's happening, please uh, click and join. And there's also an age resource website that's available to all the teachers in uh, adult ed, uh, especially math and science, you have access to pretests, you have access to exercise, everything um, is available here for you to, to use. All right, so now to finish up, <laughs> hopefully you have a better idea about what the uh, CRA model is and how effective it could be in our teaching. Uh, Hopefully you'll be able to access all of this library and to make use of it in your classroom. And uh, the questioning guide that is available as a reference to just remind us on how we should guide our students in, in their learning. Sometimes it's just a, a good reminder to have. And I'm actually inviting you, it's an invitation to action. We got all of these new ideas and it would be nice that to see if any of these ideas appeals to you and you would like to test in your class in your class with some of the students that you have in mind um, and to see if it actually benefits them or not. And hopefully we'll get to see you again on February 2nd for like a, a, an hour lunch, if you want, where we could just talk informally about what your experience, what you're encountering, uh, how did it work for you, these apps, these activities, how can we make this better, what's the needs, and just to have actually a, a, an area where we could have like a focus group on just like the CCBE, like the, the cycle one uh, uh, needs in math. So that being said, I wanna thank you for attending. I know it took a lot uh, of you to, to free yourself to be here and I hope this was helpful. And, uh, and a big thanks to all my gang that helped me out. And another thing I would like to just mention, um, if you ever need any support or any help concerning curriculum, math, or science, please don't hesitate to contact me, all right? Uh, that's why I'm here for. It's a free service that the, uh, the government is offering, and I'm more than happy to, to assist you in whatever way I can. Um, I wish you a beautiful afternoon, and if you have any question, please uh, go ahead. And uh, if not, uh, I hope to see you on uh, February 12th with Nicole. We're going to be uh, hopefully uh, uh, mediating a, just a, a discussion group on uh, what we need for our kids, for our students, yeah. or adult learners. <laughs> yeah, can't wait to hear whether what you tried and bring your ideas of any kind. It'll be, it'll be fun.